Welcome to episode 217 of Grid Talk. Today we're here to review the 2022 French Grand Prix. My name is Ruby Price and joining me we have sports writer Owain Medford. Hello. Tom Downey from Everything F1. Hello. And Aaron Harper from Five Red Lights. Howdy. Uh, first, if you enjoy this podcast, we'd love it if you could take five to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you do, you'll automatically go into our monthly draw to win the Grid Talk t-shirt from our champion range of merch. And if you're one of the 72% of people who aren't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider helping us out with a like and a subscribe. So, it will take some Ferrari level of bad luck for this championship to swing away from Max Verstappen after he took a dominant win in Paul Ricard when his rival Leclerc crashed out. Aaron, we assumed it would be a two-stop when Max pitted early, but he made the one-stop work and is now 63 points ahead of Charles. How will he be feeling after those 53 laps? Oh, well, I don't think it would have been a two-stop had Leclerc not crashed. Um Red Bull had gone for the undercut, so there's a strong chance that they would have executed the two-stop, but once Leclerc was out of the way, they were never going to be challenged by Mercedes. They just didn't have the straight-line performance. So he just managed his tyres to the end. It became a very straightforward race in the end for Max Verstappen, and he'll be very, very happy about it. Um, it is a shame that we are seeing... I'm not, see- I'm not going to say... Verstappen handed the title because obviously he's having to do the hard work. He's won some races through pure skill and speed. But it could certainly be being made harder for him. Um, and that's not to say that things can't change because you know, we've, we've seen how quickly things can change in Formula One over the years. And uh, as Murray Walker always said, anything can happen in Formula One and it usually does. So, you know, don't, don't count your chickens just yet if you're a Red Bull fan. 63 points is a big lead. It's a comfortable lead. And from here, I would expect him to go and seal the deal for a second consecutive world championship. But there's still a long way to go in this championship. Ten rounds to go. And we head to Hungary next week where, you know, bowling ball Bottas turned up and he's starting even, he'll be starting even further back next week. So there's even more people for him to take out. Um, yeah, Red Bull have just got to be as they were today, very astute in their strategy, deliver a good car, and Max just has to do the rest. And that's what he did today. He didn't do any more than he needed to. So a job well done. It certainly was a job well done by Max Verstappen today. All he really had to do, as you said, was just finish the race. And that 25 points was absolutely his because, Owen, as Aaron mentioned, the Mercedes just, didn't quite have the straight line speed to be keeping up with Max or Charles whilst he was still in uh, P1 today. But Lewis Hamilton finishing P2 in a Mercedes 2-3, the first uh, double podium for the team of the season. After a lightning start, that was a very good job from Lewis Hamilton today. Yeah, excellent drive. Um, and it's one of those things, it's, it's the thing that, I don't know. I, 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 the way I like to look at it, I think that sort of uh, Mercedes is almost the anti Ferrari um, in that uh, they are, they seem uniquely able to be able to get the best out of a bad situation um, in comparison to Ferrari, who seem to get the worst out of a good situation. Um, and they're not throwing it in the wall. And the team, you know, I, I guess it's easy to chase, but they look uniquely able to just keep moving forward, keep moving in the right direction. Um, and they don't seem to be suffering many setbacks. Um, I think that's you know evident, and it's and it's the reason that we see them in the two three with Lewis Hamilton um, not especially far off, given the pace of the car. Um, Max Verstappen, obviously, there was a um, uh, a safety car uh, in between, but you know it, it looks like Mercedes are going strength to strength, and um, as you say, Lewis Hamilton did a, a, an excellent drive, um, particularly to keep Perez behind. I, I would say because I thought, I thought once Perez had DRS in the opening stages of the race, I thought that was over. Um, it wasn't, and uh, and I think that's a, a you know another big part of why uh, the Mercedes were able to get a second place today. 
Yeah, throughout the weekend, the Mercedes have had about 17, 18 kph less than the Red Bulls when the Red Bull when both teams have had DRS. So logically, when one of those cars has got DRS and is behind, you should be seeing a swap over there. But we didn't see that. And Tom, what we did see was some really smart thinking from George Russell on the virtual safety car restart to just jump ahead of Sergio Perez, who seemed to have been caught napping. Yeah, I think Perez was either having a siesta or was drinking tequila out of his onboard drink system because he was just, yeah, he was a, but Russell was sort of playing cat and mouse with him behind. He was, he was sort of going, hur, a, hur, a. And then Perez went, oh, and then Russell went, woohoo, and then went past him, basically. You know, that's that's not exactly a technical analysis, but that's just one man's analysis. Um, but yeah, it was very, very smart thinking. And um, and yeah, you know, Russell knew that Perez was struggling on those tyres, which is feels like an odd thing to say for Perez, because because obviously, you know, beforehand, you know, he's only been the tyre whisperer. Um, you know, you, you know, he sort of had he sort of has his wicked way with them, but maybe it's just not getting on as well with the 2022 tyres because obviously they're very different to what we've had before. Obviously, they're bigger wheels, you know, different, you know, they're very different and all the rest of it. So, you know, maybe maybe that's maybe that's an element of it. I don't know. Um, just, you know, just just speculating. Um, but yeah, Russell, um, Russell did uh, did a good number on Perez coming out of a uh, uh, coming out at the end of the VSC. Um, def- definitely caught Perez napping. Um, and uh, and I think Russell had the bit between his teeth, and uh, he was he was losing his cool at one point, which I think we all saw um, with that move going into uh, that move going into the I don't know if you call it chicane or not, but the, the sequence of turns on the Michelin straight, um, you know, it was a it was a very very ambitious move from Russell. Um, we've seen him do it before, and you know we've seen Max obviously do that kind of thing before. And I think if he wouldn't have clipped the curb, I think it'd have made the corner safely and he'd have been ahead on merit. But he um but he did ever so I didn't realize it at the time, but he did ever so slightly clip that inside curb like Ocon did. And it's only because Paris took avoiding action that I think we didn't see potential coming together there. I get Russell's point of um of that of that he was that he felt he was entitled to the corner. And a race is always gonna say that, aren't they? Um, but but you know, his his rear wing was sort of like alongside Russell's. Sorry, his front wing was alongside Russell. Uh, my God, alive! Russell's front wing was alongside Perez's rear wheel. There we go. It only took three goes. There's one for the clips channel. Um, but um, but you know, it was a uh, it was ambitious at best. And and you know, George and Perez rang that road. I I disagree with that. Um, you know, because. Whereas you know Perez was going to keep it on track, and then there was no track for him to keep it on because George slipped the curb, um, and then he was getting a bit hot under the collar. Well, very hot under the collar actually, because um, we you know because we heard his engineer telling him to you know just just trying to tell him to keep his head calm. Then obviously Toto twice came on the radio and was like you know come on we'll have him. Then I th- and then I think obviously when the VSC came around, Russell was like right come on son you're having it, um, and then. And then pulled that master stroke, um, or or sort of just basically, basically just um, just called Perez's bluff. I suppose is the easiest way to put it. And yeah, um, put it back on the podium. Yeah, absolutely. And as was mentioned, Aaron, Sergio Perez got caught napping. Should Sergio Perez really have been in P three at the end of this race today? Uh, yeah, I'd I'd say he should have been in P two because he. He has shown this year that he's able to extract the performance from the car, but he just had a really scruffy weekend. He was a little bit at sea on Friday with his setup work, off the pace. He got it together in qualifying, but if the Mercedes was able to deliver a, a lap instantly, getting the tyres up to temperature, then it's likely that they could have been ahead of him, or at least one of them would have been. And in the race, he fell off in terms of tyre wear and, and lap time, which was strange to see from, from Checo. There is a rumour that the, the car has been developed away from uh, Checo's liking. But that's neither here nor there because you've got to drive what you have. And recently, he's been driving very well. But 
since the Monaco win, his form seems to have dropped off a bit, which is a shame. And it certainly curtailed any hopes he had of winning the World Championship. As for today, he, he ended up where he deserved to be, which was off the podium. And without Ferrari being Ferrari, he would probably have ended up in sixth. And then you're looking at a situation where we go, well, hang on, Verstappen's won the race and Perez is way down in sixth. Have we got the best possible driver combination? So there's, there's definitely work to be done for Sergio over the next week heading into Budapest and then the, the, the summer break. And he'll be very disappointed with today. And I'm a bit disappointed with his performance as well. And I have to agree with what uh, Owen said. I expected to see Perez breeze past the Mercedes of Hamilton once he'd lost the position. But for a car with like 18 kilometers an hour of extra straight line speed to have lost the position at the start and never, ever regained it, that's worrying. And that, that is going to be of real concern to Christian Horner because if Ferrari get their act together and start winning races and putting one-twos on the board, a Sergio Perez that's not delivering is going to cost Red Bull the Constructors' Championship, even though they currently hold an 82-point advantage, which might seem ridiculous, but if you're finishing first, first or second with Max and then fifth, sixth, seventh with Checo, you're going to bleed points very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And with the Mercedes as well, revitalized and taking these P3s, P2s even, you know, that's more points that you're not getting yourself. And ultimately, it's points that, you know, could cost you a title. Oh, Wayne, um, Carlos Sainz in Ferrari. Some choice words would probably be made um, to describe Ferrari's strategy today or for the last couple of seasons, really. Um but was it also unreasonable to expect Carlos Sainz to have done such a stint on the medium tyres when most people could only really make them last about 18 laps? Uh, I don't I don't know with Ferrari. I don't know what they're... I don't... I, to me, they gave a position. Um, I, I, I don't know what to say about... I mean, they seem incompetent, um, inept. Just come like unwilling to look out the window of what's of what's happening. Um, you know, were they even in the same race? Sort of thing. Like, I I don't get the second pit stop. The, you know, I think he could have done. You know, the fuel load would, but would have burnt off, and I think even going past, I I fully would have seen him getting past, uh, getting uh, another five seconds. You know, it just it seemed to be that what was happening. You know, the, the, the pace was in the car to do it. Um, and, you know, I, I totally get listening to your driver on that. But um, it seemed ridiculous to, to make that, to, to make a call to, to do that stop, um, you know, so close to the end of the race and giving basically three and a half, four seconds per lap to be making up um, to get anywhere close to where he was um no i don't i i can't live, i can't even level the blame at sites because science did a really good job to be honest in my, in my opinion you know with what he had to do um he drove a great race um he was just given you know uh, uh just a ridiculous task um i, I can't I can't get my head around it. I, I, it's you, you've got to make the best of a bad situation, at least with one car. And I know obviously starting from the back is not it's not it's not good uh, your prospects, but you know they took a bad race and and made it even worse. And that's it's, you know cardinal sin in my opinion. So I I think it's I think it's I, honestly I think Ferrari really jumped the shark again, um, and I I don't see that getting better um, at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just 
you have to hand it to Carlos that he was able to get from P19 to what should have been a net P3. And as well, when you look at the results, that five second stop that he had to make because of the the unsafe release, he's not five seconds off Russell at the end. So why they decided to pit him at the time that they did was, I just think, so ill thought out. But anyway, Tom, uh, Fernando Alonso, P6, uh, you would argue a great result for the Alpine team. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and you know, I said yesterday that Alonso will do something with a little bit of flair. And it's like his opening lap was exactly that. You, you know, the, you know the way he was just, uh, you know, the you know the way he made moves at the start. You know, had a super launch. Both he and Hamilton, absolutely outstanding launches today. You know, you know it was proper chef's kiss moment. Um, and then and then yeah, and then um, Alonso just did what he did. And when he when he came over the team radio towards the end, when his engineer said to him, he said, "Oh, by the way, Norris is behind." And, and Alonso is basically saying, "Yeah, no bother. Just let him catch up and, him, and burn up his tires." He did exactly that. Which meant Ocon could catch up. And once again, did you see the gap? Um, uh, you know, did 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 you, did you see the gap between Alonso and uh, and and who was in front of him? Yeah, because because yeah, it was signs and Perez and Russell and that group. It was about twenty something seconds in the end. And there was you know you know Alonso was just doing his best little Miss DRS train impression. Um, and and he, he did he did exactly that. And he backed up the McLarens. Uh yeah, and it was just it was it was a bit of a vintage Fernando Alonso performance, you know, you know, bit of flair, bit of sass, um, you know, a, a lightning start, uh, you know, you know, brought home good points in the car, which isn't the best on the field. How many times have we seen him do that? So yeah, so it was a good good result for him, and it was a good result for Alpine as well, because obviously they were tied with McLaren, but they now move ahead of McLaren into um uh, they're into fourth now in the constructors' Alpine, I believe. Um, you know, so yeah, uh, yeah, good, good, good day for long. So um, I had a feeling he'd do something, you know, just a little bit special at his at his team's home race. You know, because uh, you know, because I know Alpine obviously based in Endstone. Um, you know, but but they are French backed, and you know, obviously French team, French race. You know, team Endstone. You know, slash Renault, slash Alpine, slash whoever else they've been over the years. Um, you know, they absolutely adore Alonso. And he loves Dan. There's the reason he's been there three times. So yeah, uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, he was uh, he was just putting in moves today, um, and yeah, it was just it was just good to see. Yeah, absolutely, Aaron. I would argue it was a bit of an anonymous race for Lando Norris. Obviously, you know, did a good job yesterday to put his car between the two Mercedes in qualifying. But you know, from the start of the race, and you know, being jumped by Fernando, being, I believe he was jumped by Ocon, but then the uh, Arcon and um, Sonoda thing put him further back again, but it just it was a nothing race for uh, Lando Norris. I uh, it was anonymous rather than a nothing race. He he, he just did the job that he needed to do. Uh, Nico Rosberg was saying on Sky F1 ahead of the race that he thinks Lando is a future champion, and I have to agree with him. He's driving with the maturity to become a title contender. Obviously, we're seeing, like with Charles Leclerc, how uh, drivers can fare under the, the real pressure of a world championship battle. But Lando's just doing a, an excellent job. When the car isn't coming alive, he just bags solid points. Like yesterday, he produced a stunning lap to split the two Mercedes. Uh, so you can't say fairer than that in terms of qualifying pace. And then once the Alpine was in front, you're probably not going to overtake it if you're in a McLaren because one, the Alpine is an absolute bullet in a straight line because they run the skinniest wings you will ever see. They're basically in the, in the fifties with the lack of wings and the McLaren by contrast lacks a little bit of straight line speed. It's a little bit draggy. It's a little bit heavy. It's a little bit like the Mercedes in, in that sense. And yet, Lando was still able to drag seventh place out of it. And he kept it on the road. We saw other drivers getting caught up in accidents and spinning off and just general reliability. McLaren, nice and tidy, seven points, knowledge of the updates, 
looked a lot more positive. So on a track where they'll be a bit more competitive, perhaps a little bit quicker than Alpine, they'll fancy their chances. But today was just about making sure they lost as few points as possible to Alpine. And I think Lando did just that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Wayne, Esteban Ocon, P8 in the Alpine, obviously had that coming together, which he received a five-second penalty for with Yuki Sonoda on the first lap. Um, do you agree that it was Ocon's um, fault? And ultimately, do you think that you know he could have finished further up without that penalty? Um, yeah, so it's a five second penalty, um, and he's, and you know, and he's under under five seconds away from from uh, Norris. So you know, they will at least have had a, a battle, um, assuming everything else being equal. Um, I've had a look at the results, and to be honest, the only people that uh, like you know, he started tenth and finished in eighth. The only people that um, he over uh, not the only people he overtook, but the, the two places he's made there are owing to. Um, him punting off Sonoda, so I guess that worked out for him. Um, and uh, and obviously Charles Leclerc. Um, so you know, I don't I don't see that as a you know, it, it's an average race. It's you know, but to my, to my eye at least, that's starting where you've uh, sorry, that's finishing where you've started. I mean, he's he's profited off, um, you know, in my opinion, a not particularly well punished um, uh, mistake, uh, and you know, really understated into into Sonoda and obviously that took Sonoda out of the race um both visit uh, both sort of metaphorically initially and then uh, and obviously literally uh, by the end when, it, when they retired the car so um it's a bit of a nothing race um but you know at least he would he would have had a chance I guess to to have a, have a, a bit of a fight with Norris um and and maybe would have been able to do um to do some extra stuff on the strategy or or help be a pincer um, for Alonso, but um, but beyond that, you know, it's a it's a solid performance. Obviously, you know, he's made the mistake and he's done his time for it, as it were. Um, but you know, beyond that, it's not. You know, I don't think there's too much to say about it to be a bit uh, past that. Yeah, I would agree with that. Tom Daniel Ricciardo is a driver under a lot of pressure from the media, from fans, from um, pretty much everyone, really. And probably including himself, but he's managed to, you know, cut finish home in P9, which I think is about where he started. Um, but considering that Daniel Ricciardo really just needs to, you know, be bagging some of these kind of points, I think it's a job well done for him. Is it though? Because if he's, he started P9, but we had a, you know, we had Leclerc obviously conk out in front of him. So if you finish a net P8, then you know, you know, that would have been sort of on course, but you know, you, you got passed by Ocon, um, you know, towards the latter stages of the race. So that that was his main battle that race. He did have a decent start, and he was, you know, he was looking. I did notice he was he was having a little sniff at Norris at the start, um, as they sort of come around that back loop that takes you back onto the main straight. I can't remember what turn it is. Sorry, I think it's turn six. I could be completely wrong, um, so I'm not even going to attempt to guess what. To what number two it is um yeah you know he showed in this sort of like decent you know perhaps a bit a bit of promise or whatever but again it just fell into sort of nothingness quite quickly um yeah i agree ruby no one knows what turns they really are it, it gives me a migraine that track honestly um but um but yeah no he, uh I'm trying really hard not to go over old ground with Danny because, uh, you know, we've gone over it enough times and it's not going to do it. I doubt he listens to this anyway. Um, but it, you never know. Um, you, you know, and, and he's, he's obviously made his intentions very clear. Um, I just want him to... I just want him to have a couple of weekends where he can just... You know, just, just sort of like... You know, even if it's nothing unspectacular, you know, if you just say, like, qualifies P8, finishes P6... You know, qualifies P9, finishes P7. This weekend could have been a good weekend for that. You know, he, quali you know, he qualified P11, but obviously moved up to P9 with Sainz and K-Mag with their benching penalties. Um, you know, so started on the road P9. Um, 
he, but but you know, on merit, he still didn't make it into QC when his teammate put it P five. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's um, it's a tricky one. I get with qualifying that obviously the track ramps up all the rest of it, and you know, so I was get more and more at one, all that kind of thing. But he's just not looking as settled in that car. Um, so, yeah, um, you, you know, today, like I said. It was a good opportunity for him to get some good, good points on the board. Okay, he got what you get what two points for ninth place. Um, you'd argue, given a quarter of the field didn't finish, as you put it in the live chat, you'd have expected, you know, you, I'd have expected more from him. Yeah, I mean that is a good counter argument to what I said started with. Um, Aaron, a driver who did have an anonymous race until literally the last corner after a little bit of a tussle with his teammate, it seems. Um, Lance Stroll rounding off the points positions for Aston Martin. It's a point, and I think Lance is very much in need of those. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point for him and for Aston Martin. I think there was a little bit of uh, sorting out to do at the end of the race, considering it was uh, teammate versus teammate into the final corner. Um, yeah, quiet race from Stroll. We didn't see them a whole lot. We saw them together on the on the final lap. That was about it. So I can't really talk talk too much about Lance's race per se. I'm assuming he probably stopped under the safety car and then just ran to the end. Uh, he, yeah, he, he was in tenth for a long time. So he's been fairly consistent in that respect and. Whether that's him or the car or a combination of the, the the layout allowing him to stay in front, but it's a job well done. He's managed to get himself tenth place, having started something like sixteenth or seventeenth. So that's a, that's a good solid effort and a well managed race. He got a little bit shirty with his engineer over the radio, but that's Lance and. You know, if I if I had someone in my ear telling me about different things that didn't really matter, and I'm trying to drive at 200 miles an hour, I think I'd be a bit shirty with people too. But nevertheless, it's another tenth place. He likes to finish tenth in 2022, doesn't he, Lance? And uh, another point doesn't really help Aston Martin in the grand scheme of things uh, because they only gain one point on Alpha Tauri ahead of them. But I suppose it, it's it's a single point. It's one more than Williams, but that that's a, probably a slightly damning indictment on where Aston Martin's uh, performance level is at the moment. Yeah, it certainly is a bit of a damning one. Um, and uh, Wayne, the only real thing we saw from Vettel, uh, other than the little coming together with Lance in the final corner, um, he made a good take, a good overtake on Albon to um, get into. I think it was P. 11 where he's actually finished up so there is at least something that Sebastian Vettel still got some life with yeah it's, it's, super, it's good racing driver I don't you know it's, I don't think that's ever been up for debate obviously he's had you know periods of time where he's not been um, as good up to his best which we know is astoundingly high um, I must have missed that overtake to be honest with you uh, but um, it, all I remember is uh, the, them fighting that hard right at the end. I don't know why they were fighting that hard, uh, the two uh, Astons. I think that was very high risk for a team that, again, is eight points or yeah, eight points off their, their closest rival um, in the constructors. And I, I really don't see why why they need to be fighting that hard just to just to stay on terms. I don't see the point. Um, but they decided to. Um, they got really close in the last quarter. That's what I, that, you know. It's a it's a decent enough race for that one. I think for both uh, Astons, to be honest, I think I'm glad that they're actually both in. Um, you know, obviously the retirements notwithstanding, the fact that they're actually fairly close to uh, being in the top ten is a is a positive. Um, whether that's on true performance, I, I think remains to be seen. I'd like to see that a bit more consistently. But beyond that, yeah, that's fair for you. <laughs> that is certainly this brand of vessel that we've certainly got and tom i'm going to go to you because um we're having some issues with aaron uh pierre gasly p12 not really the best home race for him but it didn't it's 
the not great uh, home race kind of started yesterday with his qualifying performance, didn't it? Yeah, um, I thought it was going to be, you know, I thought we were going to be on to perhaps a bit of a better weekend for Cassidy. And he was looking good in pre-practice on Friday, but pre-practice means not all. But at the end of the day, you know, if you can't put it, if you can't put it in the qualifying lap, then, uh, then yeah, you know, you're not going to get much. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, uh, you know, he, he went out in Q1, didn't have a great race and, you know, finished, finished outside the points again. Um, just, uh, you know, just, uh, just, yeah, it's just, uh, just not a good race weekend for him. Like I said last week or maybe the week before now, I said, Dazzly just needs, he needs a summer break. We've got one race left next week. Um, and he just, uh, yeah, he uh, he just needs some time off. He needs some time away from racing. And like I said before, maybe some time away from social media because he'll do his mind the world good. I did it and it, it was brilliant. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, just, just, he, he just needs a mental reset. And I think he's getting himself, probably getting himself a bit worked up over where's he going to go in F1 because, there aren't really any seats around at the minute. Um, you know, the, the Red Bull door's been shut in his face and he needs to get out of the Red Bull programme full stop. Because um, if he doesn't, you know, his time's going to expire in F1. Because he's been in it full time since 2018, let's not forget. And he made his debut the midway through 2017. So, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not like he's a relative newbie. And, you know, that's an awfully long time to be in a quote-unquote junior seat. Especially given he's got another season coming up, you know. So, um, so I, I don't know. He, he just, you know, he didn't do himself that many favors this weekend. He needs to, um, yeah. He just, he just needs to, uh, he just needs to have some good weekends, like like he had, you know, like like we saw so many of last year and and the year before, um, and even in the last half of twenty nineteen, after he was dropped by Red Bull. So, you know, we just, you know, we need the old Gasly back. Maybe he needs more time to gel with the new cars and, you know, the Alpha Tari doesn't look as competitive. But also, um, uh, you know, um, you know, Tsunoda's still having, you know, you know, still put it in Q3 and would have probably had a decent race had on not punted him off the track at the start. So, um, you know, so it can't all be blamed on the car. You know, Gasly's got to take some accountability for it. Um, you know, you know, that's that's why I said I think I think he just needs a bit of a reset. Yeah, I do think you know some of it does obviously, like you say, come down to the fact that the Alpha Tari for this year is just not the car that it was last season. But no, but then none of them are. Um, whereas you know, obviously last season we we basically had the same cars for two years because of the situation, as you know, some uh, organisations have taken to calling it. But Aaron, um, Alex Albon. Another anonymous race for him. The upgraded Williams just seems to be settled around that, you know, P11 to P15 margin for at least one of their drivers. Yeah, I think this podcast for me is a bit more eventful than Alex Halpon's race because the washing line's just been blown over, which is why I had to disappear for a moment. Um, yeah, aside from the washing being blown over, Albon's race was... Uh, exciting only when Carlos Sainz was pulled out in front of him and he had to jam on the brakes in the pit lane. Apart from that, he was never really going to trouble the points. And you say Williams are sort of nestled in that midfield area, and that's improvement from where they were. It shows that the car is being developed in the right direction. And the midfield, as we know, is competitive. And if McLaren and Alpine are locking out the remaining points positions. It only leaves one or two spots up for grabs. And if Lance Stroll uh, pulls a worldie, then there's nothing left. So P13 for Alex Albon today, I think is a solid drive. He doesn't need to, well, I say he doesn't need to be spectacular and flashy, but he just needs to be effective in that car, which is what he's doing because everyone's looking at him and going, oh, wow, yeah, he, he really is a good driver. And he's continuing to show it. Maybe he's one of those drivers who isn't quite good enough for one of the top teams, but he will excel in a midfield team. P11 
possibly like Pierre Gasly. So for, for Alex, it's just about you know being effective, leading that team, being a good racing driver. And he's doing exactly that. He's having a really good season. He scored a few points. Everyone's looking at him favorably again. There's a more positive vibe around him. So I think all of the things that he would have wanted to accomplish coming into the season, he's ticked all the boxes. And, you know, a P13 in a Williams, that's not to be discredited. It's a solid effort. You know, it's, it's a lot of effort for no reward, but there will be more clever people than us diving into the data and looking at just how effective his performance was because he's, again, out, outraised his teammate, outqualified his teammate. He got into... Did he get into Q2 yesterday? He did. Yes. So, again, another Q2 appearance for Alex. You know, job done, well done. Move on to Hungary. Yeah, absolutely. Moving on to Hungary. Um, and speaking of people who have an affinity with Hungary, Owain, uh, Valtteri Bottas, one of the three drivers to star on the hard tyres, the other two being Gasly and Sainz, with the exception of signs, I think ultimately where Bottas has finished has just kind of shown that starting on the hard tyre just wasn't the right decision. You know, he pitted on lap 37, which came 20 laps after the safety car, which, you know, just ruled everything out from that strategy. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure you can level blame it then, though, to be honest with you, um, in some ways. I mean, I don't, I can't remember the, um, the allocation of tyres that they would have had at the start of the race. But, um, yeah, I, don't, I, I think I don't think it was a bad tactical decision to start on the hards. I think it would have actually been quite a good idea um, initially without that safety car having happened. Um, obviously, the safety car did happen. So, um, obviously, you don't want to come in and, and pit. Um, you know, you want to gain track position at least. I think, unfortunately, that, yeah, the... the you know, looking back on it, it's just like, well, that's just sometimes the sometimes the cards the cards just fall against you, um, and that and that's heads you into a quite a difficult. Um, I think you did a one stop, quite a difficult race. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's anything that he could have done. I don't think that they, there's anything they could have done. I think this is just sort of a natural playing out of the strategy that they chose, and uh, unfortunately, it's got it's gone against them. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that, that's not a bad drive by Bottas. It's just a, it's just, just sometimes it goes against you. Yeah, and another um, team whose strategy ended up going against them with the safety car, Mick Schumacher, the last of the um, finishers, pitted early, you know, for the hards, was quicker than most of the cars on track, but ultimately that safety car just neutralized the Haas. And Tom, you know, a disappointing weekend for Mick Schumacher and Haas in general. Yeah. Um, like I said on the quality show yesterday, you know, Mick's qualifying result on paper is not a true reflection of his pace because he put that car into the top 10 in Q1. And it's not like he did a big corner cut together. I know he did go four wheels off the track, um, but it, it, well, it was marginal, but yeah, it was still okay. It was still all four wheels, but you still would have comf comf comfortably, comfortably been in Q2. I really can't talk today. I do apologize. Um, it's uh, I can't even blame the heat anymore. Um, you know, he, yeah, he would have easily been into Q2. Um, anyway, uh, you, you know, just you know, just unfortunate that his first lap was you know, whatever happened, it happened in quality. So, you know, so his race day. Yeah, it was just unfortunate, you know. He, um, yeah, has committed early to the two stop, which, given Paul Ricard, it did look like it was going to be the way to go. Obviously, you always run the risk of a safety car or a VSC or a red flag or whatever. But we've never had that many here. Um, I know we've only been here since 2018. And obviously, we didn't have a race in 2020, uh, 2020, you know, because COVID. Um, but yeah, as soon as you know, when that when the two has pit and then Leclerc, you know, bombed that what about five ten laps later. Yeah, uh, Gunter Steiner must have his heart must have just sunk when he was on the pit wall, thinking, "Oh God, this is just not what we need." Um, it wasn't what they needed at all, and yeah, it just it didn't 
it didn't do Mick any favors, unfortunately. You know, his uh, his point streak has come to an end. Um, but it's the weekend is not a reflect is not a true reflection on his pace. Um, and like I, again, like I said yesterday, he's got that fiery side. You know, like his dad obviously used to have when he raced, beginning to come out and he's driving. You know, he's he stopped being so nice. In, in the nicest way possible. I know that I know that must, I know that's a bit of a contradiction in terms, but um, but but he's 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 got a bit of uh, you know he's got a bit of uh, you wouldn't even call it aggression, but he's just got a you know, just got a bit of you know just a bit of sort of like again not provide. I don't quite know what the right word is. The attitude. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, that's 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 the best word. You know, yeah, absolutely. Um, I like how that comes straight to your mind. Um, you know, it's um, yeah. You know, it, it, his his driving. You know, you know it, it, we saw it when he was racing against Max in Silverstone, and then we saw it again in Hungary, and we saw it. Uh, sorry, uh, we saw it in Austria, um, but we saw it in Hungary last year, which is the only chance last year that he was genuinely going to be on for points. And then obviously the car last year was an absolute dog, so it didn't happen. But I said it last year. Um, I said we need to see more of that Mick Schumacher, and it's beginning to come out a bit more now. And it's what we need. You know, he always seems to sort of blossom in his second season of whatever he's done. If you look at his F two season, you know, his first season, I didn't race him at all in his first season. I was one of those people saying anything and kidding anything and blah blah blah. Um, but no, he absolutely came through in his second season, and then he's beginning to do that now in F one. Um, so hopefully the second half of the second season has bring a couple more upgrades. Um, yeah, he's a, he's on the right track, is Mick. Yeah, it's always easy to think of the right words when you're not the one that's speaking them, Tom. So, you know, don't worry. I've got your back. <laughs> um, but Aaron, Guanyu, Joe Guanyu, um, P16, BNF ultimately, Ferrari power unit suspicions, um, just more unreliability letting down Guan Yu here. Yeah, it's just another another DNF for, for Joe, unfortunately. I mean, when, when the car is on song and it finishes the race, Joe is actually able to put together some really good weekends. And we've seen that recently. He's driven really, really well. Um, but the last two rounds, it's just not quite worked out for Alfa Romeo. They've not had the car to capitalize. And they've very quickly fallen away from that battle for P4. But they're comfortably ahead of Haas and you know, they're still way above expectation in, in P6 in the championship and Joe is outperforming everybody's expectations so yeah it's just it's just one of those things that's that's racing unfortunately so I, I believe he was still classified something like six laps down but Alpha well I say Alpha Ferrari need to get on top of this because we've had Haas suffer um, reliability issues and Tom by the way I thought your Gunther Steiner impression was very very mild I'm sure there was some some door smashing going on <laughs> at the safety car uh, uh, there, there could have been but I'm trying to keep it PG <laughs> and then you got Alfa Romeo who also have the Ferrari power unit and they seem to be getting tripped up by it too as do the main Ferrari team so Ferrari have banked on performance for their power units rather than reliability. And it is catching them out. It's catching their customers out. Uh, if I was Alfa Romeo, I'd be asking for some sort of refund. I hope they've kept their receipts. So, yeah, I'd be knocking on Mattia Bonato's door and whoever's the head of the Ferrari engine department and saying, look, this isn't the product we paid for. It doesn't get to the end of the race. Yeah, glass cannon's all well and good until you start to factor in the fact it's made out of glass, in which case, you know, glass shatters. Oh, Wayne, Nicholas Latifi tried to make an overtake, which is something that we don't often get to say, but then he had contact with K-Mag during the incident and ultimately led to both K-Mag and Latifi retiring. So is that a sign that Nicholas Latifi shouldn't be trying to make overtakes or... Is it more, you know, sometimes you need to choose your overtakes a bit more wisely? Uh, I mean, it's choose your, I mean, it's one of those things that it's there's some people that can find gaps and get through those gaps without without having an issue, and there's some people who are who can't. And uh, and I would say that Nicholas Satifi is probably one of those people, unfortunately. Um, 
So yeah, I think it's I think it's just a, a product product of people going racing, but I don't think the TV has necessarily the skill, let alone the car, to be able to um be overtaking, <laughs> unfortunately. Um so I you know, not to say that there was that there was always gonna end in, in tears, but um you know, there's there's some drivers who are luckier than others, so um in, in that respect. Um so yeah, I, you know, I mean credit for trying, um, because I think too often we've we've criticized the TFI for not trying or or you know not necessarily um going for for moves that you could have done or being a bit um what's the word? I don't know. A bit of a pushover. Um so it's good to see me at least. Um but uh, you know, have another go. Don't don't hit both. Don't don't run your opponent out of room and uh you know don't, don't, and basically don't you know don't retire because it's just causing issues and it's a DNF. Um but beyond that, you know, I think it's just it's what it is. Yeah, and you did at least get a chance to try out the new upgraded Williams this weekend, which you know, after two weeks of not having the upgrades, it's a bit strange that it took so long to get around. But I guess, you know, in this um era of budget cap, you want to make sure that if you're putting upgrades on both cars that they do work. And who's let's face it, who's the more likely driver to bring the car home as much as it didn't actually happen at Silverstone for uh, Alex Alpon in the upgraded car. But, you know, they want to know that. Tom, um, Kevin Magnussen had a pretty decent start to the race. He made up a lot of positions from last on the grid. And then ultimately it just all went downhill from the safety car and the Haas early stop. Yeah. Um, Kevin Mag was one of the sort of biggest sufferers from, from the safety car um, coming out when he did, because he was the very first car to pit, I believe, aside from Sonoda, who also put on, I, I, you know, he was the first of the, "Quote unquote normal pit stops or the sort of planned pit stops, if you like. Um, I believe, anyway. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm sure the internet will. Um, yeah, he, he was. Uh, he, he came in, swapped to Haas, like we said about Mick. Committed very early to a two-stop strategy. Was probably going to work out, um, but with their tires have been burnt up quite a bit by the end because it was." I think it was the hottest race we've had so far this year. Um, you know, I, I again, I think, you know, because it said track temperatures were pushing 50 degrees at one point. Um, and, you know, the south of France, middle of, middle of July, I know it gets hot down there. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it would have been... A, I, I wonder if they would have almost pitted too early. I wonder if they perhaps should have wasted a couple of laps. But also, I don't have the data that they had, so I don't know. Maybe they're gambling on us. No, they couldn't gamble on a safety car because it horrendously backfired. Um, so yeah, so yeah, yeah, came out. It was going well, um, and then you know he, he you know he, um, he let's see if he had that coming together at turn two. Towards the end, there's no further action for either of them. Um, I checked the FIA website. There's, yeah, there's nothing more coming from it, but that sort of like that basically brought curtains to any further, you know, any um, any further race that he was going to have. And and I think he was a DNF in the end. Was he? He came out. Yeah, that's why we're talking about him at this point of the. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I honestly couldn't remember if he DNF or if he was just like at the back of the grid. Um, I wasn't paying much attention to the back, to be honest. So yeah, um, yeah. Again, you know, disappointing for him, disappointing for Haas. But like I said about Mick, not a true reflection on their speed. Yeah, absolutely. And Aaron, a driver who seemed to have the speed today, um, Charles Leclerc, had pulled ahead of Max Verstappen about two seconds. Um, still in sort of undercut territory, and we do know that the undercut is powerful around Paul Ricard. But clearly, Ferrari just banked on. You know, being able to out strategize Red Bull. I'm not sure where they got that idea from, but ultimately, Charles Leclerc crashing out. He did hold his hands up and say that it was his own mistake, but there were suspicions around, you know, the throttle issue from Austria returning. Ultimately, just a devastating day for Charles Leclerc, particularly, you know, 
somewhat writing off his championship chances without something major happening? You know, I don't think it matters whether it was a car fault or a driver error. The the crux of it is that Charles Leclerc has crashed or well, has failed to finish when leading the race for the third time this season. And if you, if you take all of those three and you turn them just into second places, this, um, this championship looks drastically different. But the fact, the fact that remains that the Charles Leclerc has been driving brilliantly all season. The pole position that was phenomenal. Okay, he had a little bit of help from Carlos Sainz, but that's what you have to do. That was Ferrari nailing the strategy for once. And then he was in control. He managed that opening stint beautifully because I was convinced on the third lap when Verstappen got DRS, I thought it was all over. I absolutely thought it was all over. But he held firm. He was fast in the, all the right places to keep Verstappen behind and force Verstappen to go for the undercut. Verstappen would have probably gone for the undercut anyway had he stayed behind. Uh, well, he did, obviously. Um, but finding himself in second position, they would have always gone for it. But then to cut to the scene of him in the wall, it's another potential 25 points down the drain. And he, he said it was a mistake. I'm not so sure. I mean, Nico Rosberg was saying about the gust of wind, and if there's anyone who's an expert on a gust of wind costing you a win, it's Nico Rosberg. But it's just such a devastating blow. After Austria, where he was magnificent, and he passed Verstappen three times and won the race, this was the worst possible backup to it. And the, the scream down the radio is the new uh, version of Hamilton's Oh No in Malaysia. It's just, it's slightly haunting. It's, as a, as a, as a neutral person looking at it, it's not very good for the championship because you always want a competitive championship. You don't always get it. But the potential has been for a super competitive championship but through a myriad of reasons, it seems that Leclerc's championship challenge, if it's not over now, it is severely hamstrung because of this. And it, it really shouldn't be. Really, really shouldn't be. It's such a shame that we're talking about it in this way when it could be thrilling and engaging, but it looks like it's just going to run away from Ferrari and Leclerc at the moment. Yeah, and in his interview with, I think it was Rachel Brooks in the paddock afterwards, he said, you know, uh, lost 25 points here, uh, lost seven points in Imola because of his mistakes. And he said that if he loses the championship by 32 points, he knows, you know, where the fault lies. And that's, you know, following his, you know, I, it was my mistake. But ultimately, you know, like you say, Ferrari have let him down at points, reliabilities let him down and the occasional mistake has let him down. Owain, Yuki Spinoda's race, you know, was just ended by Ocon effectively. He retired on lap 17 when the safety car came out, but I think it was, the writing was on the wall. It was never going to recover from the start, was it? No. Um, you get punted off. You're at the back of the field, right? Like, it's not even, it's not even a case of getting, you know, getting turned around and, Getting, you know, just getting back on with it. You know, it's right at the start. From that point onwards, he was always going to be at least ten seconds back on the rest of the field. Um, that for our, uh, sorry, the Alpha Tower is not fast enough to bring it through the field uh, to any meaningful amount. Um, you know, I'm not saying give up immediately. I think, to be honest, that, that when they when they retired the car was probably the best time to save the engine, live to fight another day. Um, you know, it's annoying. I would like to see what uh, Sonoda would have done, um, but you know, it really, it didn't. It, it, I, there was nothing he could have done um, when, once he got uh, hit. That was it for me. Um, I thought that there's there's no more you can do. Um, 
Yes, Yuki Spinoda. Um, I think that I think that would be fair. Like that would be fair game as a pun. If if he hadn't like if he'd done anything wrong, he didn't. He was just on the outside, and then someone just did into him. And but it's not his fault. What could he do? Um, maybe leave a bit more space. But then again, I, I don't. I don't it's not one of those things. It wasn't like a Ocon's, you know, you know, lost a massive amount of downforce, but whatever. No, I, I you know, to sort of, uh, his, his, his day ended before it really began. Um, like I say, there's probably just a small um, benefit of them actually being able to uh, retire the car only a third, of the, the third of the way through the race rather than running it um, to futility. Yeah, absolutely. They might as well, you know, come in get some new parts for the next time around not put mileage on the engine which the power units are certainly uh th- their price tag will be adding up this season unless you have a mercedes one it seems for the most part um but yeah that is a uh, look through the driver's finishing positions now it's time to assign a star of the race so i'm going to start with you tom who is your driver of the day Carlos Sainz. I think that's a pretty definitive answer that's probably going to come from most of us. But yeah, Carlos Sainz is certainly a good shout. Aaron? I fundamentally disagree with Carlos Sainz. Not because I dislike him. Because starting at the back in a fast car, you're always going to make progress. So you look, it looks better than it really was. I can see why Carlos Sainz was voted driver of the day because his pace was outstanding. Um, but I'm actually going to give it to uh, George Russell for his brilliant little bit of gamesmanship uh, catching Sergio Perez off guard um, and then holding him off as well in the closing laps. So that was really super impressive. But you know, Carlos Sainz did do a really good job and uh, if he'd started at the front, he'd have probably won the race. He had the pace to do it, but he didn't. So I can't give him it. Yeah, the other two Mercedes are also good shouts for this. Um, so good idea to you know assign it to George Russell as well. Owen, who are you going for? One or the two? One or the three? Someone else entirely? I was going to go for Lewis Hamilton because I was just, you know, the, the ability to hold off Perez. Um that's right. Ah, uh, that so, eye roll. <laughs> I didn't see it. No what eye roll. I was just like, I'm so, I'm sorry, but if you're eighty like if you're eighteen K slower when you've both got DRS and you know, you managed to defend your way uh from the you know, from the fastest car on track, you know, from the race with you know, the, the sorry, the teammate of the guy who's um who's won the race. Like like I said before, I thought I thought Perez would blow by Hamilton. Um, he didn't. So I think you know I think Hamilton did a great job in a car that probably wasn't the the best. And you know he's got a second place. Like he's he's inching closer. Um, you know I think I I, I still think the uh, Hamilton uh, getting a win this season is on, and I think it's sort of a natural forward step. So we got one vote for Sainz, one vote for Russell, one vote for Hamilton. No one's going to say Max Verstappen, really, because, you know, ultimately started P2, P1 didn't finish. So, you know, t- inherits P1 and just then has to finish the race. I'm going to go diplomatic and say that you're all right. You know, I'm going to sit on the fence. If I can just say on Owen's point about Hamilton winning a race this, this season... <laughs> The next race is Hungary, and that's one of his most successful circuits. So, yeah, I I don't know how well the Mercedes will fare there. We'll probably start jumping up and down again, mate, knowing my predictions this year. But uh, he could be a strong bet for at least a podium again in Hungary. Yeah, and just a note, we are previewing the Hungary, um, the Hungarian Grand Prix tomorrow live on YouTube. So if you're watching now, make sure you're watching tomorrow night as well. Um, and if you're watching this or listening to this after that episode, make sure you also check that out, you know, um, some good people on the show. But yeah, so that's our um, drivers of the day. 
now it's time to give our panelists some opportunity to pr- give a bit of self promotion. Um, so let's start off with Tom. Everything F one. Go ahead. Cheers, Rubes. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm part of everything F one. We cover. Any race car has got four wheels, really. So F1, F2, F3, W Series, IndyCar, Formula E. Those are our main ones at the moment. Um, yeah, we uh, we have a plethora of social media accounts. So all your favorite platforms, you know, so what what have we got? Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter. I think those are the big four. Um, yeah, that, the handle for that is at Join the F1. Uh, we have a website, everythingf1.com, our YouTube channel, we search everything up one, you'll find us. And finally, our podcast, which we do weekly. Excuse me, I've got hiccups. Um, so you can find that on all your favorite podcasting platforms. We do race reviews, previews, all that good stuff. And sometimes we have some rather snazzy guests on as well. Always love a nice snazzy guest. Aaron, you're from the Five Red Lights podcast. Take it away. Um the host of the five red lights podcast uh we do race recaps with a grand prix cap i do driver of the month videos uh blah, blah, blah. the flying lap where i try and beat the pole position lap time and tell you everything that happened in the race i also write for f1, for f1 chronicle so go and check out the race report which is already up and posted that was ready before we, we sat down to record this show and i also write for inside f2 so you can find me in lots of places on twitter on instagram uh, at five underscore red underscore lights or at Aaron Harper 41. And you can find me on Instagram, which is five red lights. Yeah. And Owain, you're generally like me, mostly found on here. But if there's anything you want to chuck in this segment, go ahead. Um, I can't keep parroting the whole. If you'd like to go and read meme articles, go and get those on sportlightpro.com. I very rarely write anymore, unfortunately. Um, but if I do, I'll be, it will be on uh, the F, uh, oh goodness me, uh, words, the F1 Chronicle website. That's where it will be. Yeah, check out the F1 Chronicle website, as I'm sure you have if you are watching this podcast or listening to this podcast or, you know, reading any of Aaron's race roundups and stuff like that. But me, I'm, like I say, mostly on here, but you can find me on the socials at Rubes, R-U-U-B-E-Z. <laughs> Put a 001 on the end if you're on Instagram. And with that, Grid Talk is available on YouTube, where most episodes are recorded live, as you'll know if you're currently watching the live stream. Stick around, because we'll be having a bit more of a discussion, answering some questions that have been left in the comments, just for a little bit, um, just to, you know, give something back. Uh, But we're also available on Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal, Omni Studio, and Pocket Casts. Just search for Omni on Grid Talk for our back catalogue of shows with previews and reactions to qualifying and the race results. Please consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can get mics, lights, and better recording equipment. You can get your hands on some official Grid Talk merchandise on f1chronicle.com forward slash store. And don't forget, if you do leave a review, you will automatically be entered into a, a chance to win some of our champion range of merch. Also, make sure you subscribe so you're the first to know when each new episode is released weekly. We'll also be back soon tomorrow. Uh, with plenty more F1 content. So thank you very much to everyone for listening and thank you very much to everyone for joining me and goodbye. And that is that. So Hungary tomorrow. Um, Obviously it will get discussed in the preview podcast tomorrow, but what is, what's everyone thinking for Hungary other than Aaron, you know, putting his money on a Lewis Hamilton win? Uh, it's, a, it's a Mercedes 1-2. And uh, Latifi on the podium in third. Oh, Bottas, little everybody. Strange things have happened. <laughs> I don't know. Anyone I've else? Got no, clue. no, I've got no clue. I just about struggled through that podcast. I think, I think, I think we managed to make it through with no, no visible internet issues. Now we could hear you the whole way through. Yeah, we. Yay. That's all right. You only need to hear me. Actually, no, wait. I've, I've been reliably informed. That's the worst part. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's have a look at some uh, comments then, I guess. Um, 
Jared Bradley turned out to be a very exciting race, an enjoyable race. Ferrari and Red Bull went at their best, and Mercedes capitalised. Um, I would agree with that. It was an enjoyable race in the sense there was always the potential for something to happen, and there were a lot of close on-track battles. You know, ignore the 10.5 second gap between P1 and P2 and the six second gap between P2 and P3. But, you know, Leclerc versus Verstappen for the first 17 laps was very enthralling. Um, And then at the end, Sergio and Russell, also quite entertaining. Yeah, it was quite a good race, actually. And it was such a shame that Leclerc uh, biffed in the barrier because... We could have had so much more of Verstappen and and Leclerc going at it. Um, it's just the story of the season, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Leclerc is is there; he's able to match Verstappen, but uh, it's just bad luck, mistakes, Ferrariisms. It's the story of this year, I think. I think. Ferrariisms, yeah. Certainly is. I really wonder about the culture of Ferrari. Yeah, I mean, Sainz has said like he doesn't put the blame on um, Ferrari for what's happened today, and he has total trust in his team. So you've got a question. Why? Cool ladies Why ladies. does he have trust in them? How could they literally pay to say that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's true. Ruined. <laughs> they ruined his race. Like, told him during a battle. You know bloody come in and pick and firm and all that stuff. And then when they and they put it in a lap later or whatever, and it's just like, you would have made the five seconds. Yeah. The the irony as well was like, on the broadcast, obviously, that radio message came up whilst he was like, getting past Perez by the by pit, the pit lane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was the mo- it was the most well-timed uh, team radio, wasn't it? Box, box, box. But he's actually just going around the outside. Yeah. Well, the, the alternative was um, when it flashed up with Leclerc being in the wall and the th- first thing you hear is Ferrari saying, how are the tyres? Yeah. <laughs> I, w- I want to know who does the delay for the... Uh, for the. I don't know, uh, but they need a pay rise for that one. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Beautiful typing. Like, have... just... <laughs> Sorry, God. the cat's woken up. It was some great timing. Um, yeah, and speaking Ferrari. of uh, Ferrari and signs... Just Ferrari... Do I do all right? <laughs> do, we to, do, do we need to call someone? I, I just, yeah, Ferrari, tell them to pull the tell them to sort it out. Yeah, yeah, pull the finger out. Gee, oh, so so bad. On this topic, um, a comment from individual one. Um, Sign should be able to call his own races. He has saved himself and the team many points so far this year, but not any to go. Carlos was driving away from the rest before he came in. I bet Carlos would have been over five seconds at the end of the race to stay third or even fourth, which is exactly what we've been saying. Yeah. You know, it was foolish and ill thought out for Ferrari to, you know, make that decision. Yeah, but you can't you can't just lay that blame at Benato's feet because this has been systemic within Ferrari for many years and they've had uh, the, the car salesman bloke and then they had... Uh, Arriva Benny, who I believe is now uh, Juventus Football Club like CEO or something yeah. I, I, crazy. I, funny enough, I was looking this up yesterday. He is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. I mean, just jump from one funny major enough, owned, Italian... owned by the same family that owns Ferrari. Are they? Yeah. yeah maybe maybe that's so. why Juventus makes such poor decisions in the transfer market. But anyway, um, yeah. Well, this is a fighting Barca who somehow is still still running, even though they're a billion in debt. Like how? How? <laughs> <laughs> this has just turned into a football show all of a sudden. <laughs> no, this is this has turned into a, how? How are that? The, 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 sorry, sorry. You brought Italian you brought up football. <laughs> yeah, just so, sorry. I'm anno- I'm annoyed that Barcelona are a club in in more debt more debt than Berry ever were, um, and uh, and are still able to keep signing people. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly. A question. It's the way the world is, unfortunately. <laughs> Helps when you. But got... Yeah, I, I don't think you can just label the label Bonotto with the the mismanagement of like strategy. I can't remember. I think it might have been Ted Kravitz who said on, I think it might have been on his uh, his notebook show. Notebook. 
with, um, I think it was the British Grand Prix, where he said there must be something within the culture. It might have been Karun Chandok as well, who's, who might have said it. But there must be something within the culture, like you said, I mean, about Ferrari, that inhibits people from making these firm decisions and just taking charge. If you see, like, at Mercedes and a Red Bull, they make a decision and then they bear the consequences on their shoulders. At Ferrari, they're, they probably work in a bit of fear of the tabloids out there because otherwise they'll just get taken to the cleaners and then get sacked and end up, you know, wherever, cleaning the streets or something because no one wants to know who they are because they're the guy who costs Ferrari or something. So it's a, it's a probably a really stressful culture and you, you're always, almost second guessing yourself like a hundred percent of the time absolutely i think i do think that bonotto is the person when you look at ferrari you don't see someone that could come in at the minute and replace bonotto to an extent it's a bit like looking at a you know a political situation that's going on in the uk um but i do think that you know the impact that bonotto has had since he was made the um team principal of ferrari like that has been for the most part positive um and has brought around what you, I'd consider stability in Ferrari. You know, if you look at who we had previously, you know, Arriva Bene and um, who was the other one? Marco Mattiacci. Thank you. Um, you know, there was such a, it was obviously a blame culture in Ferrari. They've always had a blame culture, but it was just, I'd say so much worse because of, how you know Bonotto will stay cool on you know the radio Bonotto will be able to like you know reason with people but with um Arriva Benny and please say the other one Matiachi thank you um it was it was not cool it was you know the Italian passion that we are kind of used to seeing but I just think Bonotto is at the minute the right person for it but you know yeah you see certainly much more calm. There's none of the when, when they win, he's never too excited, and when they they have a difficult day, he's never too down about it. And you, you can say like the same about like Toto Wolf as well. Like it's it's just good management. Um, I'm not so sure about Christian Horner because sometimes he, <laughs> he says some interesting things. Um, but the I'm like, not so a fan of that man. <laughs> no, good old Karen. The best um, thing he's got is a Coventry City supporter. <laughs> I'm not even really? sure that can make it better. <laughs> it makes Who it better. Supports Coventry City. So I'll just let it stop because you're talking about football. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go on. Finish about Karen. <laughs> yeah, so like, if, you, if you're too up and down, like with Arriva Bene and Masiachi, then you know, the, 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 the team gets a little bit too... Well, the, the waves get too choppy, basically. There's too much emotion. There's too much going on. You know... You, when you when you rise high, it's an even bigger fall. So, you know, he does well at keeping that ship fairly steady, and just it's being uh, sabotaged by the crew. Yeah, well, well done on vocalising it because that is exactly what I've, what I was trying to say in a lot less words. <laughs> um, comment from John Mims um, did obviously just get here at the time. Apologies if already discussed, but wondering why Checo was so far off Max this weekend. Um, and following on from that, Jared Bradley has suggested that, like, was Perez's driving style curtailed by the two track limits warnings that he received so early on in the race? That's a very uh, good point. Po- possibly. Possibly. Yeah. But also the aforementioned tequila. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I honestly don't think that Paris did anything wrong I think he like with, with I, I think honestly he was just dead on the um on the delta that they would have had on on his dashboard um yeah. and oh honestly d- Russell just played a blinder <laughs> it was so good he got him a driver of the day I, th- I think For also me. like Russell <laughs> had been putting it in his mind so far well yeah it, like it just so far back as well because he was moving like over, so I'm going like, it really was... slowly. And I, I was just like, like, one time he was up the inside. What was that? Oh, mm. I was like, at one point, Russell was up the inside, wasn't he? Behind the VSC. Mm. Which yeah. It took ages to end. It was ending for like a minute. 
Yeah, I, I just... think it has like a random, like it's supposed to randomly end, isn't it? Um, like a random number of it's seconds. Really random. Yeah, but it was... I, don't, I don't think I don't like the idea of that. To be fair, I think they should at least have like a countdown or something of because they, they do that. Like, I don't know I was just watching, um, what was it? Six hours a monster, I think, and uh, and they you know, they count down when a slow zone or something like a full course yellow is going to happen. And it's fundamentally the same thing. Yeah. Count they do the same in Formula E, don't they? I say count it down, or count it in and count it out. So at least like, you know, I don't know. But... Yeah. My guess would be it's so that the, whoever's in charge of the race direction, I think that's who would like, or it might be the stewards, um, can't be like, all right, cool. So there's 10 seconds to go from now. As soon as, you know, someone's about to get onto a straight for, you know, the VSC to end. Um, there, are, there is obviously, you know, when the safety car ends, we know where that's going to stop. Um, Do we? <laughs> <laughs> Do we really? Generally. Know how the process works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, right. I believe that that is. I, let's call that there. Um, I was going to say, I need to get on the road. <laughs> yes. Thank, yeah. Thanks, I everyone, need. for watching the stream, um, except for one person who I've reported in the uh, live chat. But thank you very much to everyone else for joining me as well. No problem. No problem. And, Cheers, all. And, yeah. Good and chat. We'll see you next time. Yes. See you later. See ya. Bye-bye.